Father, we just want to thank you so much for this beautiful day that you've given to us. And Father, we just stand in awe of your love and your great salvation that you have obtained for us. And Father, again, as we open your word this morning, we ask for the Holy Spirit to be the teacher. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, you all know Travis, don't you? Yeah, he comes to my Bible study on Mondays. And so on Monday, he said, you need to have a complete break, is what he told me. <laughs> and so I went, so we went to the coast on Tuesday. And that's the first time I'd ever been through the Avenue of the Giants. And he said he was just tickled pink at watching my face and my mouth because it, my eyes looked like saucers and my mouth was wide open and I looked like a little kid <laughs> when I was viewing that. Oh yes, we went quite a few different places there, but, it, but that, was, that was just so awesome. And that's, that's what it's like when I study about the gospel. I'm just totally awed, totally amazed uh, at God's wonderful plan of salvation and his love to us. Okay, so last week, you guys got off the topic a little bit. So we're going to stay off the topic. <laughs> so you're going to stay off topic, you say? No, we're, we'll, we're, we're actually going to be on topic, but we're going to finish up what we kind of touched on last week. So it'll be... Uh, interesting. So our text this morning is Romans 8:18. 8, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And we're looking at that phrase about the glory that is to be revealed to us. And this is talking about last day events is what we're talking about. But before I touch on that, I want to read a few comments here. Uh, from a book that I won't give you the author's name. <laughs> but anyway, it says, For long ages, men were taught that they must earn their acceptance with God and climb the weary ladder to heaven. The, the gospel became good advice rather than good news, and the glory of a reconciliation between God and man already accomplished by the God-man was obscured. Salvation was man-centered, and the coming of Luther was the coming of a new Copernicus who directed men to a new viewpoint of reality that was theocentric, or God-centered. Wherever men are taught that righteousness is something of their own achieving, and that God accepts sinners only after they have become saints, there we have the taking away of the daily and the casting down and the trampling underfoot of the sanctuary. There we have the false gospel of Babylon that leads to confusion. The restoring, therefore, of the sanctuary requires first the proclamation of the everlasting gospel of God's grace, whereby all men hear that God is already reconciled to them through Christ and that this man receives sinners. Such a message is foretold in Matthew 24, 14, and Revelation 14, 6 through 12, and has sounded forth to some degree ever since Calvary. But it is an application of the gospel given in Eden when the sinner was told that God himself, by his grace, would subdue the serpent and place a holy enmity in the hearts of men against the sin they, they naturally love. Today, the heady wine of Babylon is still being offered to the multitudes of earth. It comes in diverse forms, but reveals its true nature whenever it leads men to look to themselves rather than to Christ. The modern seeking after an experience to validate one's acceptance with heaven is a revelation to the errors of the dark age, is a reversion to the errors of the dark ages. The gospel of the extreme forms of the contemporary charismatic movement, such as the health and wealth gospel and name it and claim it variety, is Babylonian at its core. 
anything in religion that is not sola gratia, solely by grace, or sola fide, solely by faith, that is, sola Christus, solely by Christ, comes from beneath and not from above. You, in the beginning of what you just read, it says this, this teaching of must earn salvation. I think there's a dual thing going on, and we just spent five days with the thought of can earn. Not must, but can. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's also a teaching out there. Mm -hmm. Right. Not one. And then uh, there's this saying uh, short of the glory of God. And this is the glory that we're talking about. It seems to be emphasizing or implying at least that we are short of that at this point. Yes, we are. And as long as we are on this earth, we will fall short of that. Right. Absolutely. And Right. Yes. Any system, any teaching that seeks to do by human effort what Christ has already done, that believe God's favor is granted by any merit in us rather than holy in Christ, that looks to any experience in the present rather than Christ's experience at the cross, that substitutes any word of man for the word of God, that system, that teaching, cast down the holy angel, God's sanctuary, God's priest. Every hierarchical re religious system, every movement exalting as authority anything other than scripture as interpreted to the surrendered soul by the Holy Spirit, every group that forgets that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, is essentially Babylonian. Therefore, come out of her, my people. So you need to be really clear on this. And like I was mentioning last week, where the problem has come into being is we have failed to see the distinction between the gospel and its fruit. During the Reformation, this is what they, they, they basically came to realize that they had to see this distinction between the two. In experience... It, you can't separate the two. The moment you are justified, that very moment you are also sanctified. But there is a clear distinction between the two. And one is perfect and finished. The other is imperfect and not finished. That's, that's why we have to be very clear on that. The gospel is perfect and it is finished. And the fruit of the gospel is imperfect and not finished, see. And so, the gospel is what saves. The fruit does not save. Could you, could you say that the fruit of the gospel is a blessing as well? Yes. Yes, it's a blessing of the gospel. It actually is. Yes, but we must be always clear on that distinction there. Now, when it comes to actual experience, like I say, you can't really separate the two because the moment you are justified, that moment you are set apart for a holy purpose and your life begins to change from then on and it will continue to change. But it will always be what? This side of heaven. Imperfect. This side of heaven, it will always be imperfect. We are only perfect in who? in Jesus Christ and in him alone. I just want to say you don't have to look at it from the standpoint of it being imperfect. You can look at it from the standpoint of being a blessing. Yes. You know, so it's a, a growth process that you can have right. joy in and it's happening. It's just a blessing joy. Yes. So what we're looking at now, or, or we were going to look at last week, was the hope of the gospel. And this is, uh, you know, the Christian, first of all, his view of time is different from the non-believer. In other words, the non-believer does not see a future. All he sees is what is here on this earth. 
A Christian sees that there is a division of time. In other words, there is the now time or the present age, and then there is the age that is coming, is how the Christian views that. And the reason that Paul is, is bringing this out is because it's our focusing on this that is going to give us comfort and encouragement as we face trials and tribulations in life. Our focus needs to be on the hope of the gospel. And this is why Paul is bringing this out so clearly. So, in the Bible, in, sec, uh, in Titus 2.13, it's called the blessed hope, is what we're looking at. And so, another term that's used in the theological world, and, and I'm going to use that term this morning, I will explain it, is the term eschatology. And eschatology is the study of last day events, is what it's all about. And so we're going to look at that a little bit this morning. And one of the things is, must eschatology be panic theology? You see, most of your teaching on eschatology or latter-day events is what? It's panic theology. In other words, what does it do to you? Exactly. It gets you all worked up and all fearful and you're wondering if you're going to make it and, and you know all this kind of thing and you're worried about all these beasts and all these different things uh, on that. You're worried about the events of the future and the future itself, all that kind of thing. It becomes panic theology. And that's not the way the New Testament teaches this. The New Testament teaches that the blessed hope should be what? Something we're looking forward to. It's not a panic thing. It's something we are actually looking forward to. So the New Testament calls the second advent the blessed hope. It implies that contemplation of that blessed hope automatically leads to increase in faith, hope, and love. This is a far cry from the apocalyptic fever frequently associated with modern presentations of the end. So this is quite opposite of that. So the first thing I want us to look at this morning is this uh, thing we were looking at a little bit uh, last week. You know, I have it drawn out here of the two ages. In other words, if this was Jewish, this would be a circle next to a circle. In other words, old age, new age. New age is when the Messiah comes and everything is finished, see. Whereas the Christian perspective on this is a little different. You can't all see this, can you? <laughs> I'm not sure which is the best place to put it on that, but... Anyway, uh, in the Christian perspective, is that the two ages run together on that. And they overlap. In other words, you have the old age, Adam, and you have the new age, Christ. In the old age, you have wrath, sin, law, and death. In the new age, you are set free from wrath, from sin, from law, and death. You know, and these, this is how this is brought out in Scripture. However, this is actually where we live, and so there is a tension between the two ages. The new age is already here, but we're still in the old age. They're overlapping, and so there's a tension between the new and the old, and that is what uh, Paul calls sin in the flesh. We're still struggling with sin. Even though we are free from it, even though we're out of its kingdom and we're out of its realm. So this is a tension that exists there. In other words, we have not come to the ideal of the new age yet. We are growing toward that. And there's a tension there. Well, there's no Christ in the old age. Right. Yes. Big time. 
time for non-believers. Mm -hmm. But but uh, still, as believers, you're affected by by the fact that everyone's not in Christ. Right. Absolutely. And you're still affected within yourself because you still have the sinful nature in you. And so that causes uh, the tension. Okay, so in studying this, there is what is known as inaugurated eschatology, realized eschatology, and consummated eschatology. And the way the New Testament teaches is that the end times begins at the cross. In other words, Christ inaugurates the end times, is what happens. He inaugurates the end times. And then at the, at the very end is consummated eschatology, and that will be an absolute full end, a complete end will take place. But in between, in the present time, we are under realized eschatology. And realized eschatology is who, what, where we are in Jesus Christ right now. Based on inaugurated eschatology, based on the perfect and finished work of Jesus Christ, the perfect atonement. And that's where we're living now. How God regards us in his son. This is what we're talking about here. And, I, and we're going to be looking at some verses in the Bible that show this, how this works. But first of all, I want to bring out some points here before we go into that. So it comes down to... Uh, it has come to a commonplace in Pauline studies that even if Paul retains the eschatological perspective, the center of gravity has shifted to realized eschatology. In other words, how is this affecting you now in the present? In the event of, in history, Jesus Christ is an eschatological event which in some way is related to the age to come and has significantly changed the structure of the timeline. See, he's completely changed the structure of the timeline. What this means is what should be happening here, God has done what with it? He has transferred it to here. See, what should be happening at the very end, he has transferred to here. And, how, and I'll illustrate this, um, uh, that it is because of this modification of the redemptive timeline that Paul can speak of the kingdom of God, not only as an eschatological inheritance, but also as the realm of pleasant blessing. God has already delivered us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his son. Colossians 1.13. See, this being transferred into the kingdom of his son would naturally be a very end time event. But what he has done is what? He has transferred us into the kingdom of his son at the cross. That's where this has taken place. So this becomes realized eschatology is what Paul is, is, is bringing out here. Although he still lives in the old evil age, the believer, in some real sense, is also already in the kingdom of Christ. The blessing of this kingdom are not to be found on the physical level, but include righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Eternal life, which is in the eschatological blessing, has come to men in the corruption and decay of the old age. In other words, when the Bible says in John 5:24. You have eternal life now, see, where that should be where? Over here. So it's been transferred at the cross. So at the cross, we have had what? If you are in Christ, you have eternal life. You have eternal life right now. So that is a real blessing. 
Another thing we need to understand is this term acquittal. Acquittal is where you, what, what is acquittal associated with? The law, and what else? It's always associated with judgment. So judgment is considered what? A consummated eschatology. That's where the judgment usually is, is. But what happens is that what Paul tells us is that this verdict of acquittal was transferred where? To the cross, to inaugurated eschatology. That's where it's been transferred to. Last day events. Yes, last day events. <clears throat> These are th theological terms that I'm using here, but uh, so, so these things have been, been transferred, see, and so when the Bible says that I have been declared justified, have I truly been acquitted? Yes, in Jesus Christ. That is a reality that I have right now, that I have been acquitted. In fact, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5, verse 9, which is a good passage for this, it says, Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved, future, from the wrath of God through him. So we shall be saved from what? From future wrath. We no longer have to be fearful. Yes. Yeah, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Jesus Christ. You see how the New Testament writers, this thinking is, is coming very clearly through in scriptures. So this concept of justification, for justification is an eschatological event belonging to the end of the age, which nevertheless has already taken place in history because of the death of Jesus Christ. In other words, uh, when Paul says, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Romans 8, and 34, he is looking forward to the final judgment when God's verdict of acquittal cannot be set aside by anyone who would bring an accusation which might result in condemnation. So what he's really telling us in Romans 5, 9 is that this has already uh, taken place and if you are in Jesus Christ, you do not have to worry about this anymore, is what he's trying to get across on that. We don't have to worry about a future Judgment, because we've been judged where? In Jesus Christ. So the justification that primarily means acquittal at the final judgment has already taken place in the present. The eschatological judgment is no longer a lone future. It has become verdict in history. Justification that belongs to the age to come and issues in the future salvation has become a present reality inasmuch as the age to come has reached back into the present evil age to bring its soteric blessings to men. An essential element in the salvation of the future age is the divine acquittal and the pronouncement of righteousness. This acquittal justification, which consists of the divine absolution of sin, has already been affected by the death of Christ and may be received by faith here and now. The future judgment has thus become essentially a present experience. God in Christ has acquitted the believer, therefore he is certain of deliverance from the wrath of God, and he no longer stands under condemnation. So this is what this whole concept is being brought out uh, in Scripture, very clearly in Scripture. A good example in Scripture of this uh, teaching is in Daniel 9.24. 
Now remember, Daniel 9, 24 through 27 is Gabriel's explanation and answer to whose prayer? Daniel's prayer. What has Daniel been praying about all along? What had happened in the history there of Daniel? What had happened? Nebuchadnezzar had come in and had destroyed Jerusalem. He had taken these individuals as prisoners and he had put them into his own, uh, along with the magicians and the soothslayers and the witches and all that. They were put in with that group. That's where they were put, because uh, that was considered the intelligentsia of that time. So they were put in that group. And when with the destruction of the temple, what did that mean to Israel? What did that mean when that temple was destroyed? It, mean, it meant that God had left them, that God had abandoned them. So all through Daniel's history, he is worked up over this. He is very concerned about this. He is crying like uh, those in Revelation, How long, how long, how long, O Lord? before your temple is what? Set right and restored. See, this is what he was doing. So Daniel 9.24 is uh, Gabriel's answer uh, to Daniel. And it says, Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish what? The transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. And who fulfilled that? Jesus Christ fulfilled every one of those six things. Every one of them. In other words, that's your inaugurated eschatology. In other words, at the cross, this was going to take place. And this is what Gabriel is telling Daniel. And this is when the temple would really truly be restored. The real temple, in other words, would be totally restored on that. Also, it has the application of what? Consummated eschatology, when this is all brought to an absolute, complete end. See, but the first is the inaugurated eschatology. This is at the cross. So this is realized eschatology to us on that. Now let me read you another statement here that is very interesting. It says, we have often overlooked the, the fact that Gabriel was commanded to explain to Daniel the meaning of the vindication of the sanctuary, Daniel 8.14. Thus, thus we should find in Gabriel's message of 9.24 to 27 just what we seek. Verse 24 is the summary statement preceding the detailed elucidation of the following three verses. The summary is the answer to Daniel's prayer for the Lord to do something about uh, his desolate sanctuary. See 918. The key terms include transgression, sin, iniquity, atonement, most holy, which expressions are found only combined in one other passage of scripture, Leviticus 16. So, and, the, and the, if you want to look at the Leviticus 16, see verses 21, 2, 15, 16, 17, 33, and 34. What then is the cleansing of the sanctuary? It is the making an end of sin and the bringing in of everlasting righteousness. It is the making of atonement that is wiping away of evil. Forensically, this took place at the cross. 
but its consummation is the last judgment which will cleanse the universe from sin and sinners. Here is the inspired scriptural interpretation of Daniel 8.14. It does in, indeed point to the day of atonement fulfilled at Calvary and soon to be filled full by the final judgment of God. It does not refer to anything in 1844. <laughs> so what I want you to see is this is good news, folks. And it's always good news when you're looking at the gospel. Yes, absolutely. And as long as that person puts his trust in the merits of Christ, not in anything in himself, that stands. That doesn't change, and that never will change, as long as he's trusting in the merits of Christ. In other words, as long as you trust in what? The finished and perfect work of Jesus Christ, what he did on Calvary 2,000 years ago. Nothing in you. Because when you focus on Jerry Williams, or any of you, as an example here this morning, when you focus on that, you have no joy, you have no peace, you have no assurance, and you have no security. See, like I said, one of the big problems has been keeping a distinction between the gospel and its fruits. What Jesus did is perfect and finished. What is happening in me is imperfect and not finished. That's why it's not salvic. That's why it's not salvic. So if you're trying, when you're, when you're, if you've got to do something, see the good news, good advice is you're told to do something. Good news is you're told that somebody else has done something and that somebody else has done that for you and to you. That's the good news, see? And there's a big difference there. And I'm afraid if you mix those two up, and I think we have a problem with this big time, we're into Roman Catholicism when you do that. When you do that. Remember, go ahead. Exactly. Right, yes, absolutely. And that's why we've got to really realize what we are, who we are, and where we are in Jesus Christ. Because this is what the good news is telling us, see. This is inaugurated eschatology, realized eschatology, see. And that's something that's, that's really true of us now. And so this is why it's important that we see this distinction. Remember the difference between, and, and this is a very subtle difference, because when you're looking at Roman Catholic theology and go back to the Council of Trent, it's all spelt out, just read through it. Do Roman Catholics teach justification by faith? Yes, they do. They teach justification by faith. What divides us, folks? What is the dividing issue? The dividing issue is that biblically we are declared righteous. Are we experimentally righteous? No. We are declared righteous by God. This is a forensic thing that takes place. In Roman Catholicism, and that's why they call our teaching legal fiction and make-believe righteousness because you cannot be declared just or righteous or acquitted until you are just. 
and righteous. So what do they do? They put this in the driver's seat and this in the rear. Is what they do. They switch those two. See, then the fruit of the gospel becomes your what? Your salvation. Yes. Uh, it's very, <laughs> how do I say this? Very dangerous is right. It's very, um, where's the focus? Yes. Yes, yes. And, and, it, and, and when you're looking at this, you're saying that the atonement was what? Incomplete. That it wasn't finished, see. And the Bible is telling us that we have a complete and a finished atonement. And we need to really realize that uh, and understand that. Any other questions before we go on? We need to understand that we don't even realize it. We are allowed to realize it by Jesus Christ. Yes. Even our realizations coming from Him, not us. Yes. That he allows, he allows that to yes. Everything comes from Him. There's no question about confessing your sins or repenting of your sins. Uh, that's going to happen. If you are truly in Christ, it's going to happen. You know, if you screw up, the Holy Spirit's going to tweak you somewhere along the, on, in the day, you know, about it. Sometimes you, when you screw up, almost instantly the Holy Spirit says something to you. And then that's when, you know, and then, but remember, confession and repentance comes from who? It comes from the Holy Spirit. It comes from God. It doesn't come from you, see. And, and if we were to focus on that, on ourselves, remember that our confession would never be perfect. Our repentance would never be perfect. Because everything we do is tainted with what? With self, see. And that's why... Sanctification is imperfect and unfinished. Justification is perfect and finished. And that's why our focus has to always be there. And that's why justification, the reformers used the term justified by faith only or justified by faith alone. What they meant by that is that's what was salvic. Where in Roman Catholicism they were teaching both justification and sanctification was salvic. See, it was faith and works. See, and that was, was a distinct difference there. So you need to understand that distinct difference. Now, God never redeems a person without regenerating him. You know, and God never uh, redeems a person without um, putting new life in him and starting the, the work of sanctification in that individual. That's a fact. But this does not contribute one iota to your salvation. That's the thing that was very clearly taught in the Reformation. And by the way, the Reformers did not put down sanctification. They did not uh, speak lightly of that at all. They just wanted to be very clear about that we understood where our salvation lay. And they had to make that clear distinction from the Church of Rome. And I'll tell you, it's been a problem ever since. That's why E.J. Wagner in the 1880s, when he was discussing the gospel, he said, you people still have the marks. In other words, he said, you're not out of Rome when it came to the gospel. They were still having problems. See.
No. Yes. No. Right, and, and that's another thing. If I was to ask any of us this morning, myself included, are you positive that you have dealt with every sin that you've ever done in your life? Do you even remember them all? <laughs> See, I sure don't. <laughs> you know, that's, that's why it's imperfect. See, we're imperfect, and thus it's imperfect. That's, that's, that's what the problem is. When we look at that, yes, we are there. One of my favorites, even though it's very painful, is when I bite the inside of my cheek. It really hurts, but I understand why that happened. Mm -hmm. There's a reason, mm -hmm. you know, and I understand it. Yes, and another thing we need to understand in this verse in First John one nine. Let's go there real quick. First John one nine. It says, if we, and actually the Greek reads, if we keep on confessing our sins, he is faithful and righteous to keep on forgiving us our sins and to keep on cleansing us from all unrighteousness, is how it reads in the Greek. That's the present indicative active that's used there. But the thing you have to realize, and this is very important that you understand this, when was your sin forgiven? At the cross. How much sin? Past, present, and future. So God is, what the passage, the good news of that verse is that God is just and faithful to keep on cleansing us. Why? Because he has to. Yeah. Yes. Yep. And so remember, he has to. Be, why does he have to? Because he already did. See, in Jesus Christ on the cross. If he decided at this point, can, if you confess to sin and he decided not to forgive you, there's double jeopardy taking place there. So God is just and faithful. In other words, God doesn't do that. See, he's just and faithful because he's already done that in Jesus Christ on the cross 2,000 years ago your past, present, and future. And we have to believe it. Absolutely. Yes, it is. It is a lie. Yeah. <laughs> yes, in fact, John is so thorough there that in verse 8 he is talking about sin as a principle, or nature, he's talking about. If you say you don't have sin, yes, and guess what? It's in the, we deceive ourselves. That's the emphatic of the sentence. It means that everybody else sees it sticking out all over you. You're the only one that doesn't see it. See. And then in verse 10, he says, if we say that we've never committed an act of sin, we make who a liar? 
we make God a liar, see? Pretty strong terminology that he's using there. And there's no way that you're going to get perfectionism from those verses, you know, at all. It's very clear. Yes. 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 So in closing today, I'm going to give some statements here that I really have liked. Uh, we didn't get as far as we should have today, but that's okay. It says, The death of Christ was not the arbitrary placing upon an innocent third party the penalty belonging to another. No, it is the offended God himself personally accepting the guilt of sinners and paying their debt. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. 2 Corinthians 5.19 Thus and thus only could he be just and the justifier. Romans 3.26 He honors the law by exacting the penalty. He transforms the sinner by the melting display of his love. Thus the loss may be saved and yet the 99 just persons of the sinless universe not be endangered. As we behold the cross, the primary glimpse of a dying man is replaced by a perception of a suffering God. Love and hatred, good and evil, are revealed by contrast as the creator endures what the creature, what the creature deserves. As we continue to gaze, it becomes apparent that we are all there on that cross. We died at 3 o'clock. Black Friday, A.D. 30. We were ruined ages before without our personal participation by the first Adam. At Calvary, again without our personal participation, we were redeemed by the second Adam. As Adam represented the race in Eden, so Christ, the second Adam, represents humanity at the cross. One has died for all, therefore all have died. 2 Corinthians 5.14. You see what biblical substitution is? It's not one man dying uh, for all men. It's all men dying in one man. Difference. In Christ, all men legally died and paid the price for their sins. Therefore, whosoever will may come, and all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven to men. God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins because the claims of the righteous eternal law have been met and we have died in our substitute and representative. God will not ask us to pay the price a second time if we abide in Christ. You are complete in him, accepted in the beloved. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Christ was ca counted as being what he was not, that we might be counted as being what we are not. 2 Corinthians 5.21 and Galatians 3.13. Therefore, despite a million sermons to the contrary, the gospel is not good advice. It is good news. Advice is about something I should do. But news concerns something already done and done by someone else. The gospel is the good news that in God's sight, sin, my sin, has been made an end of. That transgression, my transgression is finished. That iniquity, my iniquity, has been atoned for. Everlasting righteousness has been brought in for me. All that God requires of me for the time and, and eternity has already been achieved by himself in the person of his son. That achievement is credited to anyone, however vile, who believes the news, and it always results in a subsequent Christ-centered life with intense concern for the performance of the divine will in all things. That comes automatically, see. The law remains as a standard of righteousness, but Christ is its end so far as being a method of righteousness. Despite my sin and selfishness, there is no need for my trying to reconcile to God. He is already reconciled, and he has asked, be you reconciled. 
God is offering something, not demanding something. Daniel 9, 24 is ever relevant, ever new, in our age when millions are striving after some religious experience of power or ecstasy, the good news of, of a salvation objectively, historically accomplished needs to be sounded forth to all seekers. Men must be reminded that their acceptance with God does not depend upon anything other than appropriation of what Christ has done. This appropriation will change me, but I am not accepted because of that change. Nor am I rejected because the change may be slow and very incomplete in the here and now. I need not be anxious about what God thinks of me, but only what God thinks of Christ, my substitute. I am not to blaspheme his grace by thinking I must be free from sin before trusting his power to save. I must come to him just as I am, sinless, helpless, dependent. The divine plan involves our complete rescue from sin, from its guilt, its power, and its presence. Our acceptance of Calvary brings the first. Our dependence upon the living, interceding Christ brings the second, and his return accomplishes the last. The work is his, though received by our faith. Objectively, Christ is all. Subjectively, faith is all. Therefore, look back to the cross of our Messiah and King that brings the faith that justifies. Look forward to the, the coming which will co consummate the everlasting righteousness already legally achieved. That brings the hope that sanctifies. Look upward to the throne where he ministers in the Holy of Holies, the anointed sanctuary as our high priest. That brings the love which satisfies. This is the message of Daniel 9, 24 through 27. It is the everlasting gospel, the good news indeed. And always remember that the good news is, is so good, it's almost unbelievable. That's the thing we've got to realize about the good news. And too many of us don't really realize how good the good news really is. It really is good news. Okay, any questions? Our time is up. Let's bow our heads. Father, we just want to thank you for your great love to us. We thank you for this wonderful promise in Daniel 9, 24 through 27, that forensically this has already been accomplished in your son, and that forensically the heavenly sanctuary was cleansed at the cross, and that it, the, when it's all consummated, then it will be all wrapped up and totally finished. But we just thank you that we are living in realized eschatology, that we are living uh, with all these truths being true about us right now in our walk with you. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.